phone was on. How about now? Oh, and this microphone's not on. I'm, I'm noticing these arms. There's just arms. I want to hide back here for a minute. Okay, there it is. All right, well, happy birthday, Kenny, and let's see anything else that's going on this week. You don't see anything else on, on there other than the, the uh, revival. Of course, Brother Keith will be preaching there, so remember that. That'll be Wednesday night. So uh, meet here at 6, and then we'll leave out and be here before six because I'm leaving out at six, and uh, so if we need to take the bus, we'll take the bus. If not, we'll take multiple cars, do carpool or something like that. If you want to go, or you can just show up there at Calvary and and uh, eat if you'd like to do that as well. Uh, I noticed that as as we've been going through life, there's all kinds of days, right? There, there's uh, you, you have days for like other other day was was daughter day. And then there was Sunday, and then there was uh, you know love your pet day. Some there's even there's even a donut day. Yeah, and what you know what today is? Today is Pastor Appreciation Day. And so, Brother Keith, if you'd come forward, and Miss Candace, if you would come forward, because we understand that. But but you're the one that that kind of nudges him to to drive or whatever. And so the church would like to present you uh, with a card and with also with a gift uh, because we really do appreciate the folks in our church. Thank you very much. All right, well, appreciate appreciate both of you. appreciate y'all and all that you do. He's going to go up here and read this card, and eventually he'll get to the end of it. Uh, so, but we're going to go ahead and sing while he's doing that. Number 315, Bringing in the Sheep. Whatever a sheep is, bring it in. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontime and the dew. And the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, sowing in the sea. 
sunshine, sowing in the shadows, fearing neither clouds nor winter's chilling breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor's ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Going forth with weeping, sowing o'er the master, though the loss sustained our spirit often grieves. When our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep. Number 174, number 174, how firm a foundation. 174. Ye saints of the Lord, his claim for your faith in his excellent words. What more can he say than you he has said? Ye who go unto Jesus for refuge and in every condition, in sickness and health, his poverty's fail, or abounding in wealth, at home and abroad, on the land, on the sea, as your day. May demand shall your strength ever be when through fiery trial thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt. Thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine, even down to old age, all my people shall prove thy sovereign eternal unchangeable love. And when silver hair shall thy temples adorn, like clouds they shall still in my bosom be born. The soul that on Jesus has lived for reproach, I will. Not I will not deserve to his fold that so through all hell should endeavor to shame. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Thank you. All right, at this time we have. Mallory, and she's going to come and sing for us.
choose you as you are a million times cause I'm not ashamed of you I won't walk away from you I will carry you through your darkest night when you're terrified Amen. Thank you for that uh, special. Thank you for that uh, encouraging words there. And, and be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But uh, just want to say again, uh, thank you for, for appreciating us, I suppose. And, and at the end of service, I'll read the card. It's a very sweet card, very nice card. But one thing that the card pointed out, and and one thing that Stan made her come up, but, you know, pastor appreciation, uh, there may be a wise appreciation day, I don't know. But a pastor's wife is someone unique and someone special because she's in a weird position because she's the wife of a pastor. So everywhere she goes, her husband is also her pastor. And it's a pastor's job to, you know, rebuke, reprove correct with all long suffering and so he has to do that to his wife and so her words of encouragement and correction come from her husband and that, that is a difficult position for any lady to be in for her husband to have biblical authority to tell her what to do and so it takes a very unique patient understanding uh, wife to, to understand how to both accept that and overlook that sometimes, I think. Uh, but so that was wonderful to, to include her. And so 
uh, thank you for 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 that. I mean, just it's tremendous. We we are blessed uh, to be here. Uh, never feel like we do enough. Never feel like we. Uh, accomplish everything we want to accomplish but God's given the increase and God's going to give the blessings and so we're just going to uh, work and, and serve and do and whatever God blesses with we're going to rejoice and praise and and lift up our words of praise to him and so again th thank you for that we're looking at first Corinthians chapter 3 uh, looking at being laborers for God today, we're going to be a little lengthy reading. We're going to read about 17 verses. Uh, so if you want to stand at this time for the reading of the word, uh, please do so. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting with verse 1, says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hereto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for as there is among you envying and strife and divisions, and ye not carnal and walk as man? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid which is in Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built their own, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that we have to come to your house, to be with your people, to be studying your word. Father, we praise you for being our God. We praise you for the grace you gave us, for the mercy you have on us. We praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise him for the sacrifice on the cross that he willingly went and took our place, Lord. And Father, we pray that someone here today doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that they would realize that Christ died for them on the cross. That three days later, he rose out of that grave, forever becoming the only Savior of the world. And if they today would put their faith and trust in him, that today they would be saved for eternity. Father, we pray for those who are saved that we would be ever found faithful. That would be ever found working for you, sacrificing for you, serving you, giving you our all and our best, knowing that everything we have comes from you, so we should give it all back as we can. Father, we lift up each prayer request today. We lift up the Roger Stewart family and others, Lord, that, that each need on each heart, Father. There seems to be so many, but you are a great God who can handle every situation. And Father, we put all our faith and trust in you as our God. Lord, we just pray that, that your spirit would move today, that you would illuminate the word, help us to understand it, help us to be willing to decide to live it and become faithful for you. Father, we pray for the events we have coming up, the revival, the, the fall outings and other things, Lord, that everything would be done according to your will and that above all you would receive all honor and glory. For we lift it all up in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, this morning, uh, we're going to try to look and understand that we are to be laborers with God to build His churches. Uh, the church needs to be united and not divided. And as we see here in the beginning, the church at Corinth, uh, here in chapter 3, had some divisions. They had some problems. Of course, we know from, from other studies that they had some immorality, some absolutely sickening and degrading things going on in the church. And so Paul had written to them about that. 
But here in verse 3, he's, he's going to look into the fact that they had some divisions and realize and understand that a church divided cannot fully serve the Lord like they should. A people that are divided cannot fully serve God like they should. And so if you go back to verse uh, 1, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you even as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. He says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for here too you were not able to bear it. Neither yet nor are you able. What a horrible testimony for the church at Corinth. Yes, there's divisions. Yes, there's immorality. But right off the bat here in chapter 3, one of the saddest things about the church at Corinth was the fact that they were not yet able to bear the meat of the matter. They were not yet able to bear the hard stuff, the, 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 the deep stuff of the Word of God, the deep closeness and fellowship and, and rewards and blessings and love that come from a deep understanding of the Lord. Paul says, I haven't talked to you about the hard things yet because you're not even able to understand the simple things. You're not able to understand the easy things. And as children of God, we should begin with the easy things. We should begin with the fact that salvation is by Jesus Christ, by grace through faith, that He is the Savior, that He does love us, that the Spirit will convict us, and that when the Spirit convicts us, we need to believe and trust in Christ as Savior, call upon His name, seek salvation, and we shall be saved for eternity. That's the easy stuff. That's what we learn first. That's what we learn to begin with. And then we are to grow and mature and get deeper. And it's, uh, it's heartbreaking almost that Paul was able to say to the church at Corinth here, you're not ready for the hard stuff yet. You're still on the easy stuff. You need to grow. You need to mature. He calls them babes in Christ. They're children in Christ. They're youth. They're young. They're not able to take uh, the deep things. And so he says, I haven't brought that on yet. He goes on to verse 3. He says, for are ye yet carnal? Now he's going to get to the heart of the matter. They're still carnal. They're still seeking and thinking on a worldly level. They're still thinking and seeking on, on, a, on a carnal, worldly, in front of their face level. He says, you're not ready yet. <clears throat> he says, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as man? There should never be envy and strife and divisions in the Lord's house with the Lord's people. Those things are what divide a church. Those things are what cause divisions and problems. Envying. If the church is so desirous and envying of one individual or a group of individuals, it causes chaos, it causes gossip, it causes cliques and problems and issues. There should never be envying. There should never be strife and contention and fighting and fussing among individuals. And that, again, does cause division. So Paul says, look, you have envying and strife among you. He's going to say why. And the reason is absolutely superficial. The reason is not biblical. The reason they have divisions is not because they were divided over necessarily the word of God, over what was being taught. They have a division. Look at verse 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? They were fighting because Paul had baptized some. Apollos had came in as the pastor and baptized some. And some of those who thought Paul was better was standing there going, look, I am from Paul. I am of Paul. I've been baptized of Paul. And they thought they better than those who were baptized of Apollos. And Paul's going to go in here in verse 5. He says, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Like Paul goes, look, it doesn't matter who Paul is. It doesn't matter who Apollos is. You need to be focusing on the Lord. Paul is just a man. Apollos is just a man. He goes on in 6. He says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Paul was a flesh and blood man who followed Christ. Apollos was a flesh and blood man who no doubt was striving to follow Christ. Pastors are flesh and blood that strive to follow Christ. Deacons are flesh and blood. Pastors' wives are flesh and blood. Every individual in the Lord's churches is flesh and blood. There's none higher than any other. There's no hierarchy there's no, yes, true, some are more hardworking, some are more faithful, but all have that possibility. All have that ability. God expects each individual to be as faithful as that individual is capable of. 
It doesn't matter who Paul was. It doesn't matter who Apollos was. Paul says, look, quit worrying about who joined in under Apollos. Quit worrying about who joined in under me. He said, look, I've planted the church. Paul started the church. He built it. He, he was the missionary. Apollos has come in and watered. But I love the end of verse 6. It's God who gave the increase. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't Apollos. Today it's not going to be me or Stan or Steve. It's God who's going to give the increase. It's God who's going to bless his churches. It's God who strengthens his people. It's God who comforts his people. It's God who gives insight. It's God who gave the word. It's God who sent Christ. It's Christ who died on the cross. It's by his death that we saved. It's through him that we are kept eternal. It's through his power that we will continue. It's from him, by him, and through him. And it's God who will give the increase. We have to understand that, yes, God expects us to work. We are going to see later we are laborers. We have to do the outreaches. We have to be witnesses. We have to live be lives of living testimonies. We have to hand out tracts. We have to witness. We have to pray. We have to preach. We have to do all of those things. But you can hammer on the door all you want. God's the one who's got to open it and plant the seed. It's God who's got to produce. It's God who's got to grow that child. It's God who's in control of everything. And so when we understand that and we realize that, we don't prop people up on pedestals. We get on our knees and praise the Lord who deserves it. And so it's God who gives that increase. It's God who saved you. It's God who's going to save the next person. It's God who's going to build his house. And so you go there to 7, it says, So then neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. And so Paul again reminds them, look, it's not about Paul. It's not about Apollos. It's God that giveth the increase. Think about who is saying that. In our earthly mindset, if there's anybody in the Bible or any of God's people that ever had a right to say, you know, look at me, I'm somebody, it could have been Paul. And Paul not only says he's the chief of sinners, we saw that last week, he says, look, so is neither he that planted anything. Paul says, look, I don't care that I planted the church, it's God that built the church. It's God that's given the increase. It's not about what I do. It's about what he does. And today it's not about what we do. It's about what he does. Yes, we need to be faithful, but you can be faithful and have doors slammed in your face. You can be faithful and see people walk right out the door. Judas had the greatest pastor in history, and he was unfaithful. Because it's God who gives that increase. We are to be faithful, we are to live, be living testimonies, we are to live our life for Christ, we are to pray, but we may see doors literally shut. But when we see doors open, it's because God opened them. It's because God blesses them. If there's anything good we have, it's because the Lord has blessed us. When you look outside and you see the roof and the staple, it's because God blessed us. The fact that the lights are on is because God blessed us. And so when we realize that, we realize that it's not about me, it's not about us, it's not about what we've done, it's about what God's done. When we realize that, it takes a little bit of the pressure off. We're no longer pressured to try to do everything ourselves. We're, we still have to do the work, but we realize that it's all in God's hands. If the doors close, God was in control. If the doors open, God is in control. If the people come, God is in control. Whatever blessings we have is because God is in control. And so when we realize, like Paul, Paul says, I'm nothing. When we realize that, it really puts it into perspective. This is in God's hands, and if it's in God's hands, we can have peace and understanding knowing that he's in control. So look at verse 8. It says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. That used to be a great verse that people, because people used to stand on their own. A man's word used to be his bond. People used to work hard. People used to have work boots and want to do their own labor. This verse, look, it says, look, you know, he that plants, he that waters are one. The church needs to be united. The church is together. It doesn't matter who brings someone into the Lord's church. If they come and they're faithful, the whole church rejoices. If Sister Gail starts bringing in 15 people and packs two pews, we're not going to be envying of that. We're going to
to praise God that they're here because we're all in one. We're all together. And so he says, look, it's if one who waters, one who plants, we're all together. And he says, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. We're not going to have to answer for the unfaithfulness of others. We're not going to be blessed by the faithfulness of others, which is why I say used to that was a great thing. But in today's world, the modern mindset is I want to get everybody's free stuff. Well, guess what? I don't care what modern mindset you have. Every individual is going to be judged according to God by themselves, according to their own faithfulness. You're going to be judged according to, do you know Jesus Christ? It doesn't matter if your wife knows him, if your family knows him, if your entire family for history knows him. Every individual has to believe and trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior to have salvation. And so first we're judged, do you know Christ? And then after, if you do know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're going to stand before God and every good thing, bad thing, everything you've done is going to be judged and you're judged according to your personal faithfulness and works. You know, if we pictured standing before God when we got up in the morning, we might actually work a little harder. I mean, let's face it. How many of you have ever had a secular job where you had to work under a boss? Anybody? All right, most people. All right. Do you work harder when the boss is watching or when he's not there? Everybody's like, I'm not answering that. Let's face it, I know. When the boss is there, everybody's working hard. And when the boss is gone, you know, you suddenly back off to about 80%, you know. Let's, let's be honest, 50%. <laughs> you know, if we actually understood that God was watching every second, we would work a little bit harder. We would do a little bit more. If we picture standing before the judgment seat and God going, what did you do for me today? Well, Lord, you don't understand. Today was Friday and I get Fridays off. Reckon that's ever going to fly with the Lord. You know, Lord, you know, God's going to be like, I told you to rest one day a week. You worked one day a week. That's totally backwards. You know, we're all going to stand. That's what Paul's saying in verse 8. He says, Now he that planteth, he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. That verse should bring conviction, realizing that we're not a social club. We're not a place to hang out on weekends. We're not a, you know whatever we are literally laboring together with god and we are his husbandry we are his building god is building his churches we are blessed to be a part of that we are blessed to be a part of the lord's work it is an honor to serve god it is an honor for god to choose us for certain jobs it is a blessing and honor and a joy to build the Lord's churches. The ideal of labor in there is intensive. It is difficult. You can have, after service, if you want to hear some amazing stories, get Brother James to talk to you about 57 years of pastoring the Lord's churches, and he can tell you there were some difficult days. He's got some stories that I told him he was more faithful than me because I think I'd have turned around and went home going to some places he went. That is faith. That is loving and labor in the Lord. So we need that testimony from all of us. It says we are laborers together. The Lord's idea for the Lord's churches is that they all labor together. They're not, everyone in here needs to be working together. Now we can't work with false religions, but you know what I mean. In this building, in this room, all the people here, there's never a person that can't do anything. There's the workers there's the prayers, there's the whatevers. We all need everybody working. We, we, you look around, if you want to know, if you are feeling like you need to do a little bit more from God, I promise you there is work to be done. We have teaching positions. We have, you know, Bible challenge stuff that could be helped. We have outreaches coming up we have food that can be cooked things that can be handed out candy that needs to be collected there is so many things I, I people never text me and tell me that you're bored anybody ever get a text from somebody going i'm bored if you ever text me i'm bored i will text you a list of things you can do right now because there's a ton not to mention you know 
anything you do for God. And so we need to understand that and realize that it is a blessing to be a laborer with God in His church. We are the body of Christ. Christ is the head. And can you imagine that? Christ loved us enough that He died for us, and then He loves us enough that He wants to be united with us in service. I mean, goodness gracious. Have you ever known somebody you didn't like working with? You know, that person was ornery. They were late. They were always in a bad mood. So you didn't get along with them. Well, just imagine, Jesus looked down at you, and you're ornery and all not easy to work with. and We're Baptists, so we're always late. And yet Jesus loved us enough to die for us, work with us, and wants to be a part of us. And so think about that. How amazing is our Savior that He wants to be with us? We're not easy to get along with sometimes. We're, we're ornery, we're rotten, we're sinners, we're unfaithful, but Jesus loves us anyway. So let's strive to be faithful. Let's labor. It says we are laborers together. And the, look at that last two words there. We are laborers together with God. Even though there's some talented people in here, we can't do it on our own. We don't have to do it on our own because when we're united and we're together and we're doing the Lord's work, we're serving with God Himself, leading the way, paving the way, strengthening us, comforting us, carrying us, and providing everything we need. So we are laboring with the greatest foreman in eternity history, Jesus Christ and the Lord. We can get it done because he's going to do it. It can happen because he's the captain. It's going to work because the Lord is working. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When we knock on that door, God's already planting seeds. When we show faithfulness, God's already planting seeds. When we pray and seek his will, God's providing the way. We may look around and go, well, I don't understand how it's going to happen. Lord, there, there's too, it costs too much. It's too hard. It's too difficult. Realize that nothing costs too much or is too difficult because God owns everything and can do anything. We just had that faith of Caleb. I spent most of Sunday school talking about Caleb. I love Caleb. Caleb is a normal guy that simply followed God. And when you follow God, a normal guy can do anything because God can do anything. The key is following him. Look at verse 10. It says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth their own, but let every man take heed how he buildeth their own. Again, Paul's reminding them, I planted the, the church. Apollos is building it. But he says, let everyone else realize what they're building on. We've got to pay attention to the foundation that we're building on. Verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is in Jesus Christ. You cannot build a true church on anything but Jesus Christ. You could have the greatest spot in the town, which is always beside Walmart. You could have the most people. You could have the greatest cooks. You could have the most eloquent speaker. You could have the best looking choir. You could have the greatest building. But if the foundation is not Jesus Christ, it is not a real church. And it may grow and boom, but it's not going to be booming and glorifying God because the church is built on Jesus Christ. He died for it. He started it. He builds it. It's his. And so he says, no one can build on anything other than Jesus Christ. Look what he says in 11, for, uh, or verse 12. Now, if any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Now, let's look at those for one second. Gold. Does anybody like to collect gold? I love to. I just have never afforded my first piece yet. I'm a gold collector that hadn't started. <laughs> I mean, gold is a super valuable Silver, super valuable. Precious stones, super valuable. You put them through fire, gold isn't going to burn. What happens if you take wood, hay, and stubble and light a match? Will, will, will wood, hay, and stubble burn? A lot of our country is under a burn ban right now because they're afraid if a spark gets out, it's going to light up the world. You know what? God may be planning something. Well, I'm afraid of that. 
Stone, wood, hay, and stubble will burn up. So it's, it's showing your, your foundation building materials. You build with gold, silver, precious stone, wood. Anybody remember the three little pigs? I never thought I'd get to preach the three little pigs. But you remember them three little pigs? I built my house out of straw. He huffed and puffed and blew it away, right? Built his house out of sticks, huffed and puffed and blew it away. Finally built his house out of bricks, huffed and puffed, and the wolf fell over, right? When we're building a foundation on the Lord's work on Jesus Christ, we need to build with gold, silver, and precious stones. Wood, hay, and stubble are not going to survive the fire that's coming. And so look at verse 13. Paul is using this illustration. He says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Before we get to the fire and the trying, let's understand, what does it say? It says, Every man, woman, and child's work shall be made manifest. Everything you do is going to be known to the Lord and declared to the Lord. Let's understand and realize we don't work in a vacuum. We don't work for man's glory. We don't work to be seen here, but we're working for the Lord and everything, whether good or bad, will be made manifest unto Him. Those secret sins we do in the dark, God knows them. Those times we don't feel like working and we're unfaithful, God knows those times we feel like, don't feel like it, but we sacrifice and serve anyway. And by the way, almost every time you don't feel like working for the Lord, if you'll put your boots on and work for the Lord, by the time you're done, you're going to praise God that you did. You're going to go, Lord, I'm so sorry I didn't feel like it today. Lord, thank you for strengthening me. Anyway. Lord, thank you for blessing. Lord, you know, forgive this sinner. <laughs> when you put your shoes on and serve God anyway, you're going to receive a blessing. God can change your heart. It's hard to be unhappy working for the Lord. If you are, you need to repent and get your heart right first. But he says, every man's work is going to be made manifest. Everything. I don't know everyone in here's lives 24-7. I don't even know my wife's life 24-7. She doesn't know mine 24-7. God knows every one of us 24-7, our actions, our hearts, our minds. He knows if we're working with love. He knows if we're sincere. He knows if we're caring. He knows every bit of it. And it's all going to be made manifest when we stand before him. Whew. Now, we're all looking forward to that day Christ comes back, but we better be ready for the judgment. You say, well, I'm saved. Yeah, but you're still going to stand before him and be judged on if you're faithful. If you're saved and setting doing nothing, if you don't read, if you don't pray, if you don't study, if you don't participate, if you don't show up, no, you're not losing salvation. There's going to be a lot of unfaithful people in eternity going, man, I wish I was a little more faithful. And so he says, look, every man's work is going to be made manifest. He says, shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. He's using this illustration. So remember, gold, silver, precious stones, if they're tried by fire, it purifies them. They come out shinier. It gets rid of impurities. It cleans the dirt off. But if wood, hay, and stubble is tried by fire, it burns up and it disappears. It's gone into ashes. And so it says, your works will be tried by fire. Look at verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built their own he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss and so realize that if our works are tried and they come out gold precious stones and silver then we're chosen faithful then our works are faithful and we did it with a right heart with love in our heart then we're going to receive a reward that is a promise from God that your works will be rewarded if you're faithful and then the flip side is in 15 if any man's work shall be burned up if it turns out you didn't work or you didn't have many or the few you had you did it for any other reason than loving God and it burns up, you will lose and suffer loss. But Paul here is going to make it 100% clear that he's not talking about salvation because look at the rest of the verse. But he himself shall be saved. That is as clear. Paul's like, you know what? I'm talking about rewards, and I know that a few days after I write this, people are going to start perverting it for 2,000 years and trying to say you can lose your salvation. So look, I'm not talking about salvation. You're going to suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. 
The child of God that has the blood of Christ on them will never lose their salvation. But they may stand before God and see what little works they had burned up and they will lose every reward in eternity. No, they're not going to be cast into the lake of fire, but there's going to be an eternity wishing they had served Christ more. It says, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. There are a lot of people that are not going to, that are saved because they're scared to death of hell. And there's nothing wrong with being scared of hell because none of us want to go to hell or the lake of fire. But if your only motivation for trusting Christ as Savior is avoiding hell, that's okay when you begin. I don't necessarily have a problem with that. If you hear about hell, you know, I don't want none of that. I want to trust God. And that's your first step of salvation. That doesn't really bother me. But if you've been saved for 40 years and you're still only following God because you're afraid of hell, you've missed a step. We're supposed to grow in love and grow in closeness and grow in fellowship with him. Lord, I thank you that you saved me when I was young so I didn't have to fear hell, but Lord, I'm serving you today because I love you. That's what we're to grow into. That's what we're to mature into. That's the difference between works that are going to burn up and works that are precious stones and gold and silver. Yes, that person is saved, but the saved person that's faithfully serving God out of love is producing those faithful works. The person that's saved, but they're not even trying or producing the wood, hay, and stubble. And so Paul makes it quite clear we need to be faithfully serving him. He's going to go on in 16. He says, Know ye not that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? That's what I cannot understand about people that are saved that don't want to come to the Lord's New Testament churches. Don't you understand we're the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? You say, oh, I thought he was talking about the body. Well, don't get it confused. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. We are called the temple of God. Our body is. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you look at verse 19, Paul says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? So yes, after we are saved, the Holy Spirit indwells inside of us, and our body is the temple of God, which is why Baptists... Preachers eat so much so that he has more room. Seems good to me. And so our bodies are the temple of God and the Spirit does dwell inside of us. But if you look at context, going back to chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth as a whole, as a group, as building on that foundation, as building the Lord's church. And we see in 16, he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. When we meet together as a church in any function, the Holy Spirit is with us. And you say, oh, don't talk about the Spirit. I'm going to talk about the Spirit because I'm tired of other groups taking the Spirit and acting like it's doing all this. The Holy Spirit isn't making them do nonsense, but the Holy Spirit does strengthen us. It does comfort us. It does lead us. It does encourage us. It will convict you if you're lost. It will convict you if you're unfaithful. We have a powerful Holy Spirit, and it's time we realize it, and we claim it, and we rejoice in it. The Spirit of God is strong, and I'm tired of pretending He ain't. The Spirit of God is all-powerful, and we're going to start believing it. We're going to start listening it. Can the church at Lakeview grow? You bet you, because God and the Spirit can do it. Because the Spirit is here, and it's God who will give the increase. I know we've had ups. We've had downs. I know we have discouragement. I know we have this, that, and the other. I know we have sicknesses. But we have a God that's building for himself. You ever watched a building be built or ever been part of that? When you're watching that building, it looks like miserable hard work. They're building this concrete foundation. They're putting up frames. They're putting up metal frames. They're riveting and screws and nails and, and walls. and done. It looks like a catastrophe mess until it gets done. And when it gets done, you go, wow, look what they built. It is hard work serving God and watching him build his churches. But when he gets one built, you go, wow, look what God built. All that hard work that goes on behind the scenes, most people don't see God building his churches. 
And so we need to realize that we are the temple of God and the Spirit of God is here. You look at verse 17. Paul gives us a warning. He says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. I think if people realized that more, there'd be a lot less unfaithful children of God. When it's talking about defiling the temple, it means going against the Lord's churches, causing problems, causing division, uh, immorality that's running rampant, uh, issues that are going on in the Lord's churches. He says, if you defile the temple of God, God will destroy you. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. We need to understand that as the temple of God, as the Spirit dwells in us, as the body of Christ, what we have here is a blessing from God that is not to be took for granted, but should be understood as a blessing. This is not to be a part-time pleasure. It is to be a full-time service. We are not here to prop people up, to puff people up, to necessarily make you feel good about yourself. We are here to have souls saved, lives changed, and to honor and glorify God. Now when you get your heart right, and you're a saved child of God, and you're finally faithfully following Him, then you will feel good. It's not about feeling good in who you are, it's about feeling good in who He is. It's about feeling good and serving Him. It's about feeling good and giving your all for Him. It's about giving more, being part of something bigger. It's about joyfully serving our Savior. And so today, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, I pray that you will wake up and listen. I pray that you will understand that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. He died for you on the cross 2,000 years ago, taking the nails, taking the spear, taking the crown of thorns. He took your place that you deserved, that I deserved, that we all deserved. He took our place and bestowed upon us righteousness when we believe and trust in Him. He is already your Savior. He loves you. He rose from the grave. The Spirit today is here. Because remember, the Spirit's here convicting. That understanding that you have right now, that nervous feeling, that, that can't breathe feeling of I'm lost and I need Jesus. That's the Spirit telling you you need Jesus and you're under conviction. Wake up. If you will simply believe Him as Savior, call upon His name, Jesus, I realize I'm lost. I believe you. Please help me. Save me. I trust in you. However, when you believe and trust your Savior, for eternity then you are to be baptized join a New Testament church and start serving start working start laboring start living for him so as the song leader comes and the pianist comes today if you're lost I pray that you realize it and wake up I pray that you would believe and trust in Him, and if you would believe and trust in Him today, you will be saved. And then, child of God, I don't know every heart, but we know God does. I don't know if you're faithfully working or faithfully not, but God does. I don't know what your need, if, if you're hurting, if you're sorrowful, if you're backslidden, if you're depressed, if you're unfaithful. I don't know the need, but God does. The altar will be open if you want to pray in the altar. If you don't want to come forward, you can pray in your pew. But there's no reason not to get right with the Lord today. As we stand, whatever needs you have, go to the Lord. I, I need this. I need. He will help you. He will strengthen you. He will give you what you need. When God's people seek the Lord, He reaches out His hand and grabs us and pulls us to Him. If you will just pull to the Lord, He will fix whatever you have. He will strengthen you, comfort you. You say, well, I've backslid and I've done this and this. I don't care. God knows and He's going to love you anyway. He's going to forgive you. When you seek forgiveness, God's going to open up with open arms and bring you right back in just like the prodigal son. If you need Jesus for salvation, go to Him today. If you need to come back and be faithful, come to Him today. Whatever you need, go to the Lord today as we sing.